All right, guys. So Joe Rogan, arguably the most popular podcast host in the United States of America, who obviously I have been covering more so recently because it seems like he has taken more of a skeptical view towards the U.S. relationship with Israel and their ongoing war against the people of Gaza. And he recently had on this guy, Coleman Hughes, who I know absolutely nothing about other than this conversation that I witnessed here. Um, and they are going to discuss Israel and Gaza. And so I think that this is illuminating for a couple of different reasons. So let's go ahead and uh, try to work our way through this back and forth here. He is, uh, but I think I disagree with you both kind of on the Israel issue, on the the idea, there was one point where you were kind of saying it's almost as if the Jews are doing what was done to them, well, as if I'm, it's genocide. I'm saying that when you're killing 30,000 innocent civilians in response to something that killed 1,200 innocent civilians and you're continuing to bomb an area into oblivion, mm. which is what it looks like mm. when you're looking at Gaza, there's many people that have made the argument that that is at least the steps of genocide or a form of genocide. You're, you're destroying thousands and thousands of people's homes and, and killing them. So when you say 30,000 civilians, it's not 30,000 civilians that have been killed, though. How many th thousands have been killed? So according to ha uh, Gaza Health Ministry, which mm -hmm. is it is run by Hamas, the number they have is 32,000. But they don't distinguish between Hamas and civilians. How so many members of Hamas are there? 40, 50, uh, 40,000, something like that. It's, I don't think the number is known, but it's tens of thousands. So ha Hamas says 32,000 people have been killed, mm -hmm. civilians and soldiers. Israel says 13,000 soldiers have been killed by Israel. So okay. if you just being, let's not doubt either number. They could both be well, inflated. But, like, but, but if the, both of those numbers are accurate, which they may or may not be, that would be 13,000 soldiers killed, 19,000 civilians killed, mm -hmm. which for urban combat in the Middle East is a very normal ratio. I can see, if, I see if what you you're saying at, if you wanted to look at it cold and objectively. Yeah. But well, I don't, it's I don't, still... I hope it doesn't come across cold because... But it's mostly women and children that are dying, that are, that are dying because they're in a place where these terrorists are, right? I mean, this is, it's not... Because the terrorists on purpose embed themselves with the civilian population, right. which is a war... Okay. So we'll circle back around to, uh, to that argument that he's getting into there in terms of the human shields that Hamas is using. But just to get into the details of the numbers here. Okay, so this is the latest estimate here from Euromed Human Rights Monitor. Now, they say, this is according to October 7th through April 3rd, so this is a couple days out of date, but they say their latest estimates include 41,496 total who have been killed. Among those, 15,370 have been children, 9,671 have been women and they say that 37,676 have been civilians so if you were to look at the Euromed human rights monitor numbers this independent human rights organization looking at this from an impartial perspective they would estimate that there have been about 37,600 700 or so civilians that have been killed which would mean, if you do the, the math here real quick, that anywhere between 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 Hamas militants have been killed. Now, in terms of the numbers that he's giving there, from the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health versus the IDF, let's, let's say a couple of things here, right? Because I think that this is kind of important. In terms of the Gaza Ministry of Health numbers, number one, Although these have been disparaged by the Joe Biden administration early on in this war, who said the numbers are not credible, you know, the Israeli military constantly railing against these numbers as these are just Hamas's numbers. The reality of the Gaza Ministry of Health numbers is that those numbers are based on the amount of people who come through the Gaza healthcare system. Now, the Gaza healthcare system has been completely and utterly destroyed by Israel's offensive. So it is very difficult to get an updated count of the amount that have been killed inside of Gaza from the Gaza Ministry of Health for that reason. So this 30,000 number is likely totally out of date, a massive undercount by any stretch of the imagination. I think that the Euromed monitor numbers are much closer to the reality, although those numbers also may be an undercount. So. The, the, these numbers from the Gaza Hamas controlled Ministry of Health, these have been fact checked in the past by human rights organizations from the State Department, from even the Israeli government themselves. These numbers have been deemed to be reliable 
through historical example. So that 30,000 count that he's referencing there, if is, if anything, an undercount of the amount of people who have been killed so far. So then we get to the IDF's count of 13,000 Hamas militants that have been killed. Now, let's pair this together with the reporting that we covered on this channel about the AI targeting, okay, that I talked about a couple of days ago uh, as a part of the Lavender program, as a part of the Gospel program that Israel has put in, into place, as well as the, basically, the, the initiatives that they have given their on-the-ground troops where any so-called military-aged male may be considered as a potential Hamas militant. If we were to take into consideration those reports, as well as the reports of those who have been kidnapped, those who have been taken prisoner by Israel inside of Gaza, and then we later get reports that a vast majority of the people who they imprisoned, potentially tortured, who they stripped down and, and put into handcuffs, if we were to take those reports that a vast majority of the people who they have been arresting inside of Gaza alleging initially that they may be potential Hamas militants and then later we get reports that a vast majority of the people who they are arresting are actually civilians, then the 13,000 Hamas militants killed number from the IDF doesn't make any sense by any stretch of the imagination, okay? We know, according to international human rights organizations, according to the UN numbers, that even 60 to 70 percent of those who have been killed by Israel in Gaza so far over the last six months have been just women and children. So even if you were to believe that every single male who they have killed, who is not a child, has been a Hamas militant, that still wouldn't get you to that 13,000 number. So... It's not to say that Hamas is an extremely credible source or that the IDF is, is an extremely credible source. It's just a pure numbers calculation that the 13,000 Hamas militants killed does not make sense and that the 30,000 total killed from the Gaza Ministry of Health is, if anything, an undercount. Okay, so I just wanted to get that straight here, but we can continue with this interview now. So let's go ahead and, and keep it going. War crime, right. which is a strategy that they have clearly employed. When yeah. you see them, and when when the IDF went into that hospital and found uh, the Hamas, just recently, and, yes, yeah. So it's real. It's not just a conspiracy theory. We know that that's real, um, but it's still you're still talking about twenty thousand, whatever it is, of innocent people getting bombed into the Stone Age, and then there's this like. What are the pressures that are being put on people that are trying to deliver aid? How difficult yeah. is it? So my understanding of the aid issue, uh, and I've looked into it quite a bit, is that the aid is getting into Gaza. Uh, they've, they've gotten over a quarter ton of food into Gaza since the beginning of the war, which is pretty similar to the food that was getting in. The problem is it's not getting to the people, it's especially in the north, because the north is a war zone. So it's getting through the border. Israel's allowing it in. But then what happens is the IDF doesn't control the delivery. The delivery is controlled by humanitarian organizations like UNRWA and just other, a whole bevy of humanitarian organizations. And they have these aid convoys going to people, but then Hamas hijacks it, random gang of people, uh, Palestinians hijack it, hungry civilians hijack it. Uh, and it's an absolute mess in terms of distributing the aid. And that's why you see, and it was a problem in the war in Iraq too. What was the case when it was being reported? It's very difficult to know when, you know, you're getting the Hamas version of a story and then you're getting the Israeli version of a story. What happened when there was the aid truck and, and people started getting shot? The one last night. No, it was a while ago. Oh, okay. So yes, the, that, was, that one. That was a couple of weeks ago. That I don't. I don't have the full detailed version up to date of what happened there, but I believe it was. It had something to do with a, a clash between the IDF and other Palestinians that were involved in distributing the aid. Because what you have is you have Hamas, but you also have powerful families in Gaza that you could call them sort of criminal syndicates or whatever. But they're powerful, important families as well that are also taking the aid sometimes. And these are the families that if, if Israel is allowed and goes into Rafah and defeats Hamas, one of the possibilities is that they want to get these powerful Palestinian families to take over the Gaza Strip. And these people are also involved in, in, uh, in the distribution of aid or in the hoarding of aid or in the stealing of aid or in the uh, taking of aid and then selling it for very high prices on the secondary market, which is why it may not be getting to everyone in the north. So but are it's, those it's not the because... people that the Israeli soldiers shot? No, I think it, I think it turned into, uh, it could have been a panic firefight and they killed they killed civilians. What caused the panic firefight? I don't. I don't think there's details. That I don't know. So the that accusation one I don't know. was that they were shooting people that were trying yes. to get aid. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. And you don't think that's the case? I, I think it's very unlikely. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Absolutely. There, there My is... assumption is that there is going to be war crimes in this right. war. Right. Because, and I know Kurt would probably say I'm, I'm, I'm doing the tragedy of war thing, but it's actually a legitimate point in every single war, even the just ones. There are war crimes by berserk soldiers, by the good guys. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's genocide. And that doesn't mean it's not a just war. And I think that the fundamental difference between Israel and Hamas is Israeli society, however imperfectly, is not going to celebrate the monsters on their own side when they're really found to be monsters. They're not, gonna, they're not going to hand out candies to people who kill Palestinian civilians like Hamas does. Okay. I don't know if I could possibly take more of this interview. Um, so let's start with a couple things here. First off, in terms of the attack on Al-Shifa Hospital, which I believe is what they were both just referencing there, right? So I just want to remind you guys of the before and after here. This is the before of Al-Shifa Hospital, before the, the multiple weeks long raid on this uh, hospital complex, one of the few rain remaining complexes in the northern portion of Gaza, which is facing the most acute humanitarian crisis at the moment. This is the before, this is the after. You can also see other pictures that are linked down here in this Al Jazeera article showing that the entire hospital complex, not just the hospital complex, but the surrounding blocks of the complex were completely destroyed, rendered inoperable. This was the largest remaining hospital complex inside of Gaza. Again, it was in the northern portion of Gaza, which means that it is that much more important that you have some sort of remaining medical facilities to handle the starving population in Gaza. And they torched it to the ground. Now, two different things here. Number one, is it possible that there were dozens, potentially, of Hamas militants that were in the surrounding region of Al-Shifa Hospital fighting the IDF? That's, tr that's possibly true. That's plausible, right? But at the same time, does any Hamas presence in the surrounding area of Al-Shifa justify this? Justify the complete and utter destruction of the hospital complex and the surrounding blocks to the point where the hospital would be nowhere remotely close to even operable at this point? No, obviously not. Now, that's just the point on the hospital. And, and I guess the broader point that... Coleman Hughes was trying to get to there is that there is some sort of a uh, this idea of, of pushing that Hamas is hiding beneath every single civilian inside of Gaza. And so every single civilian target that is struck within Gaza is therefore justified because there was some sort of a Hamas military apparatus or a Hamas militant who is hiding under them. So two different points, you know, at the end of that conversation, it seems like at least that he is admitting that it's it, it's potentially plausible that Israel has just struck a bunch of civilians, like, for example, in the Flower Massacre, where a bunch of starving Gazans were trying to get to these aid trucks, and Israel opened fire and killed a bunch of them. He throws in a bunch of nonsense about how this was some sort of a firefight between Hamas and the IDF, and that civilians got caught in the crossfire. That part of it is not substantiated by any sort of concrete, verifiable evidence, but he at least admits that maybe there are some some violations of war. Maybe there are some, uh, you know, uh, targeting of, of civilians that is happening in these equations. But again, when it comes to Al-Shifa, when it comes to the flower massacre, when it comes to the strike on the world's central kitchen workers that we all just witnessed and covered over the last week or so, it's pretty cut and dry exactly what Israel is doing here. And the argument that they are simply striking against Hamas targets and all of these civilian buildings and all of these civilians happen to be in their way and they're an inevitable consequence of war. This isn't out of the ordinary from the Iraq war, from the Afghanistan wars and other Middle East wars. That part of it is not true at all for two major reasons. Number one, a couple of days ago, I covered on this channel the use of artificial intelligence that Israel is deploying inside of Gaza, especially towards the beginning of this war, where they, they selected tens of thousands of different targets, buildings, civilians, and um, otherwise inside of Gaza, entirely through this artificial program, both through Lavender as well as through the Gospel. And um, they struck thousands and thousands of different potential civilian infrastructure targets as well as, uh, you know, potential artificially intelligence uh, designed or, or designated, um, you know, Hamas militant targets inside of Gaza. And what we know as a result of that is that, again, the Israeli official policy is that 
for a low-ranking Hamas militant, a private, a, a the lowest-ranking militant you could possibly imagine, Israel thinks that it is justified to kill upwards of 20 civilians in order to strike that target, okay? When it comes to a higher-level Hamas militant, they think that it is acceptable to kill over 100 civilians in order to get that target. And so these are like the baseline standards that Israel has been operating with throughout this war. So I, I don't know how you could possibly have a conversation as they were in that clip of, well, Israel is just doing this targeted campaign against Hamas. And it's unfortunate because Hamas is using all these civilians as human shields. That is not the case. We saw from the 972 reporting that Israel explicitly waits until these low-ranking Hamas militants get home to their families. This was part of their program that's called Where's Daddy? Google it if you don't believe me. And they wait until these militants get home because it's easier for them to then strike the entire house, strike the entire apartment building in order to take out upwards of 20 to 100 civilians in order to target that person. So th there's no conversation to be had here about proportionality. There is no proportionality. They've destroyed mosques and churches and refugee camps and schools, university buildings through controlled demolitions, UN shelters, everything you could possibly imagine has been on the table for Israel over the last six months. And it's, again, not even comparable to previous modern examples of the worst destruction you would previously have thought you could have possibly imagined in modern warfare right? Aleppo or Mariupol in Ukraine, or, uh, you know, what were some of the other ones? Mosul in Iraq. You can point to modern historical military campaigns as a comparison point. The destruction in Gaza, you would have to go back pre-World War II, because even the destruction compared to the, the, you know, bombing of Dresden during World War II does not compare to the level of destruction inside of Gaza over the last six months. So it, it's not a historical comparison. This is totally historically unprecedented in terms of the destruction of civilian infrastructure as well as the deaths of civilians, innocent men, women, and children. So there's nothing historical to make a comparison here about. Now, in terms of the aid, this was the most laughable part of what Coleman Hughes was just talking about in this back and forth with Joe Rogan. He actually had the audacity to say, Israel is not blocking any of the aid from getting into Gaza. It's just that Hamas and other Gazans are hijacking the aid. And that's why there's a potential looming famine on the horizon, assuming that it's not already underway, which it likely is. This part is so utterly detached from reality that it's hard to know even where to begin. I mean, here from Al Jazeera, they had a report, Israel's blocking of aid, creating apocalyptic conditions inside of Gaza. A new report based on research from three countries shows that Israel is, quote, consistently and groundlessly blocking aid operations for Gaza and has generated, quote, famine-like conditions. We've known this for months and months and months at this point. Israel, in fact, by the way, declared this at the outset of their invasion of Gaza. They said, we are going to cut off electricity and fuel and water and food from getting into Gaza, right? We are fighting human animals. They announced their collective punishment of the people of Gaza, a crime against humanity, on like day one. This is not a mystery, okay? How do we think that the Joe Biden administration, with mild, vague pressure against Israel, saying maybe if you don't shape up, we're going to change U.S. policy, that they then opened up you know, a water pipe going into northern Gaza. They opened up the Arez crossing to potentially allow for slightly more aid to get into Gaza. If they are not blocking the aid, then how did that happen? Why is it that the United States and the Biden administration is talking about building this port off the coast of Gaza to deliver more aid? Why are we doing the airdrops into Gaza if Israel is not blocking the aid? There are hundreds, if not thousands of trucks that are standing on the border of Gaza trying to get desperately needed aid into the pa uh, Palestinian population there that cannot get in for one reason, that Israel is preventing them from getting in, right? I mean, so many different reports that we've got. I, again, it's like I could point to 12 different reports on how Israel is blocking the, the, this aid from getting in. And it's as if this guy is totally unaware of all of this. I mean, here from PBS, Human Rights Watch says that Israel is violating order from the top UN court by blocking aid to Gazans. Another one. 
International Court, the ICJ, orders Israel to do more to prevent famine in Gaza. They say the International Court of Justice, the one that is facilitating this South Africa-led genocide case against Israel, they issued another order on Thursday calling on Israel to allow unimpeded access for humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip, which the UN says is on the verge of famine. How do you get to this position where the International Court of Justice you know, all of these human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, the rest of them, are all saying the same thing. Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war. The ICJ is saying, you guys are not in compliance with our initial preliminary ruling from over a month ago at this point in your genocide case, and so you have to allow more aid into Gaza. How do you square that with the idea that Israel hasn't been blocking any aid from getting into Gaza? It's ludicrous. It's detached from reality. And that's what that guy, Coleman Hughes, was just espousing there. Now, again, just to, to, to hammer home the point here, I mean, I don't know how much more you could possibly ask for. The Washington Post here giving a visual perspective on the deficit from what was allowed into Gaza before October 7th versus after. This is the number. This, this dashed line here is the amount that would have gone into Gaza if October 7th never happened, if they had kept pace with the pre-October 7th level of aid getting into Gaza. And then this, this solid line down here is the truckloads since October. So in other words, as Israel has bombed out the entirety of the northern, northern portion of Gaza, much of the southern portion of Gaza has made life totally uninhabitable, has forced over a million people into the southern portion of Rafa inside of Gaza, where they are now planning on invading, has created conditions in which a majority of the population, if not the entirety of the population, is facing acute food insecurity and a potential famine, as a vast majority of the population has been displaced, as mosques, schools, refugees, shelters, every single thing you could possibly imagine has been targeted over the last six months, even as they have created that humanitarian crisis, they have allowed less aid in than what was previously being allowed in before October 7th. So how do you possibly make the argument that they're allowing all of the aid in? I mean, it's just, it's utterly ridiculous at this point. Now, one of the most egregious points that he made as a part of this clip, and I don't know if I needed to let the clip play more before they actually got to this portion of it, but one of the things that he said in this interview with Rogan is that basically you don't see Israelis, you don't see the IDF glorifying some of these human rights abuses. And that set me off almost more than anything else. Because I don't know how many different examples I've shown you guys of the IDF, of the Israeli military, who have openly bragged about and boasted and posted online their own human rights abuses. It has gotten to the point where I can't even show you guys in every video the, the kind of disgusting shit that I see come across my timeline. This is just one example of that. This was posted on one of these IDF or Israeli telegram channels here where they were responding to this strike against the world central kitchen workers, entirely innocent civilian aid workers who Israel struck one, two, and then three different times as a part of a brazen war crime. This is the kind of shit that they're posting in these telegram channels. They, they, they post a picture of a dead body up here of one of these aid workers with the passport of this aid worker who was struck. They say up here, the pig died. And then the caption here is, this Australian whore will probably no longer get to jump with the kangaroos at Sydney's amusement park. And you can see all of the laughing emojis, the, the cracking of the champagne bottles, the thumbs up, etc., etc. That part of it pissed me off almost more than anything, because where the fuck have you been to talk about how there hasn't been any praising of Israeli human rights abuses or war crimes since October 7th? This has been extremely, extremely available for anybody who wants to go and see it. So, I mean, listen, you know, on the one hand, I'm glad that Joe Rogan you know, again, the only reason I'm talking about this is because he's the most popular podcast host in the country, right? So what he says has an influence over potentially millions of people, etc. It's a good gauge of where average normie Americans are. So I'm glad that he has shown skepticism towards pro-Israel narratives and claims, etc. But at the same time, it's like, you're going to have somebody on like Coleman Hughes, right? Who, again, I know nothing about outside of this conversation, 
but who clearly has absolutely no idea what he's talking about when it comes to the actual facts on the ground of what's happening inside of Gaza right now and what has been happening over the last six months. And there's like little to no pushback. I mean, it is it, it is really disappointing. You know, not that I expect much from the, the Joe Rogan podcast or whatever, but I hope, and honestly, this is a genuine suggestion here, have on somebody like Moeen Rabani. Have on somebody like Norm Finkelstein. Have on somebody who can give you a real unfiltered two three hour long breakdown on the entirety of this so-called conflict because otherwise you're just going to keep having these back and forth disagreement narratives and and you're not really going to get to the underlying reality in terms of what is preventing a long-term peace in this conversation so that would be my suggestion to joe rogan again don't know who this guy coleman hughes is no personal hate to him but uh when it comes to this issue it seems like there are severe factual gaps in your commentary. Saying good politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me, everyone is saying.